Fantastic. Okay. Let's make a start. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Lovely. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Britton, um, one of the chapter leads at uh, Admiral. Today, I'm joined, si uh, joined alongside my colleagues today, Richard Paniers, one of our senior data engineers, Sarah Bradbeer and Christian Faber, uh, both also chapter leads. If you're wondering what is a chapter lead uh, at Admiral, essentially we have engineering managers that are also responsible for the growth and development of our members. So a few things that we want to cover in this session and what we want you guys to learn. First of all, we'll talk a little bit about Admiral and our on-prem strategic data solution. The work in progress to migrate over to GCP. Automation tools we have in place to accelerate data engineering and Admiral's plans to further explore automated processes and procedures. Now, first things first, let's talk a little bit about Admiral. So Admiral was formed back in 1993 and today is UK's, one of the UK's largest insurance companies. We provide insurance for car, van, home, pet and travel. And we also provide multi-product services. Our headquarters are based in Cardiff, South Wales, and we're the only company in Wales to be on the FTSE 100, something we're very proud of. And finally, we have sites all around the world. And if you would like to find out more information, you can visit us, visit our site at admiralgroup.co.uk. So let's talk data. Wow, that looks terrible. Wow, okay. Um, so let's talk data. So back in 2018, uh, Admiral kind of like adopted more of an agile mindset. We wanted to give more autonomy to the end users and give them that self-service experience with hands-on access to the data so they can build their own reports and dashboards and make key business decisions and innovate. Now, to adhere to that objective, we essentially had to build more of a conformed data warehouse that was adaptable to change and provided quick delivery. This is where we worked very closely with Westscape. And with Westgate, we established that we could automate some of those mundane tasks and accelerate our data engineering, but also the benefits of having a centralized metadata repository with an object-oriented architecture. And through that transformation, we've got many different layers where we extract and transform our data, which I'll talk about a little bit later on for the presentation. And we've managed to successfully create a physicalized dimensional model with many facts and dimensions that have been governed and defined. So one thing which is really beneficial to Admiral now also is the fact that we have full data source lineage, traceability and control of our data. Something that's really, really beneficial to our developers. We know exactly where our data is coming from and who is accessing our data. But also using Wearscape Red, we can track back an object's full journey from source right to target and all objects that have been hit along the way for a particular column or a particular table. Now this is a very, very high level view of our model. Let's dive a little bit deeper and look into the different layers that we have in our data warehouse. Wow, that really has not come out very well at all. Um, okay, so there are actually four main layers that we have for our strategic model. We have our landing, which is what that blue um, box is supposed to be. Our landing, our data store, our EDW and our access layer. So let's start off with our landing layer. So we incrementally load our data and all our landing tables reside in this landing layer. Some of our jobs actually load our data every two hours. So our end users can have the latest data so they can have the latest policy sales, for example. And as I said, they're incrementally loaded, but these uh, tables are transient and their primary job is just to bring in that data. It then moves into the data store, which is our DS layer. This is where exactly what it says on the tin, we store a copy of the data and we have the full history of our data. Some of our data stores go back to 2016 or when we had that data source available to us. And what's also really useful about using Wearscape is the fact that some columns are, are auto-generated. For example, we get timestamps of when we loaded that data into the table. Um, we also can create flags, so current flags. So we can see a full history, for example, of a policy, and we know by identifying particular keys what the latest or current record is. Now from the data store, we then move to EDW. Our EDW is where we have our third normal form defined uh, layer. This is essentially where we define our attributes and our keys, but also deduplicate the data and avoid any data anomalies. 
So the tables are ready to be taken to the next layer to build our facts and dimensions for our developers. Now our access layer, as I previously mentioned, this is where we store our facts and our dimensions. And as I've said previously, we've got many different fact tables at different levels of granularity from many different data sources. Now, one thing to bear in mind with our fact tables also is the fact that we work very closely with the business to define these uh, fact tables, and they've all been completely governed. We run some sessions, for example, like Beam sessions, that are kind of business event analysis, so we can gather all their requirements to ensure we're delivering exactly what they've asked for. And then MicroStrategy is where they map our facts. So MicroStrategy is our preferred business intelligence tool. And in MicroStrategy, you can build cubes on top of these fact tables. So for example, we can have like a policy sales cube. And in that cube, you can see all the attributes listed on the side and just drag and drop in the center so they can build their dashboards and reports. This is very useful for the business to make their, their key business decisions. Now, this is a very high level view of our on-premise strategic model. I'm now going to hand you over to Richard Paniers, who's going to talk more about how we plan on migrating the strategic model to the cloud. Thank you. Hi guys, uh, my name is Rich. I've been working at Admiral for the last eight years in the data warehouse um, and I'm going to be talking today a little bit about how we began our cloud migration journey and some of the key design decisions that have shaped our approach so far. So the idea of moving to the cloud has been on our minds here at Admiral for the last few years. So you may be wondering why now? Why have we suddenly decided to move to the cloud and what are some of the key benefits we hope to achieve from this? So firstly, align with Admiral's overall data strategy. Now, Admiral as a business has recently redefined its technical data strategy with the idea of unifying all data within the cloud over the next few years. Secondly, end of life of our current technology solution. The contract and support of our current technology infrastructure here at Admiral is coming to an end soon. So now is a great time for us to be exploring new technologies such as the cloud. And then lastly, ability to meet growing data demands. Now, this is a key one for us. Over the last few years here at Admiral, we've seen exponential growth within our data warehouse, a change of structure and processes, harnessing tools such as Wearscape and increasing automation has seen dramatic decreases in delivery times. We've also seen uh, more business engagement and we've seen more active users in our BI tool MicroStrategy. Now, as great as this all sounds, it also does pose various challenges. More users means there is an ever increasing demand to bring in new data to the warehouse, to bring in this data more frequently and to bring in this data faster, something that our current technology stack just cannot do. This is where we hope to achieve by moving to the cloud, where we hope to be able to utilize almost limitless storage, faster and cheaper processing. By moving to the cloud, our data warehouse can, by definition, become more elastic and we can continue that rapid delivery growth. So, how did we start our cloud journey? So, first we made a decision to, do, to go with Google Cloud. Um, we then began in planning earlier this year um, unfortunately, moving to the cloud isn't just a case of flicking a switch or dragging and dropping our architecture up into the cloud. Uh, we've had to have multiple sessions, multiple workshops, multiple training sessions, um, and we spoke with various people. Uh, this has included key engineers, uh, technical leads, uh, governance, security, uh, internal, external contractors. It's been a major challenge. Um, if I was going to speak to you about every single challenge and every single uh, design decision we've made, I'd be here all day. So instead, I'm gonna highlight five of the key design decisions that have really had an impact and shaped our approach to cloud so far. So firstly, hybrid architecture approach. So we bring in multiple data sources into our data warehouse, uh, and the majority of these currently reside on premise. The idea is that they will eventually move up into the cloud. However, this will be a slow and drawn out process. So we needed to make sure that we had an architecture that allowed us, allowed us to load data from on-premise and from the cloud and bring that together. Second key design decision was our relationship with Wearscape. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen a dramatic inc uh, decrease in delivery times in the warehouse over the last few years, and this has been predominantly down to Wearscape. Uh, Wearscape has allowed us to um, eliminate a lot of the hand coding, uh, reduce a lot of manual tasks, and also increase our automation. So it was vital for us that we would continue to use them in the cloud landscape. Uh, luckily, Wearscape have been fully supportive of our cloud migration. Um, they've helped us with data integration, they've helped to convert our metadata, and they've also provided cloud-ready templates and scripts to really accelerate that um, migration process. The next key design decision was our metadata repository. As you'll see later in the uh, slideshow, um, our metadata repository is key for our automation pipeline. 
So we needed to make the decision about where we would store this, whether it would be on-premise or in the cloud, and also what sort of database it would sit on. Next key design decision was the data transfer method. Uh, as we would be bringing data from on-premise and moving it all the way up to the cloud, we needed to make sure that this was done in a safe and secure way, and also in a way that uh, enabled us to maintain our ETL speeds. And then lastly, I wanted to touch a little bit on security and governance. So every single design decision I've spoken about so far, and in fact, everything we've done with the cloud has been heavily underpinned by security and governance. Uh, they've helped us with sorting out firewalls, access management, data quality, and this has all played a key role in how we've approached the design so far. So as a result of those key design decisions, we can now see a very high level view of our proposed cloud architecture. So you can see that there's a very clear separation between on-premise and the cloud, emphasizing that hybrid architecture approach. Um, so if I quickly run through it with you, we have the on-premise source systems here on the left being loaded via Wearscape. This data is then pushed into flat files, zipped up, and then using GSUtil, it is pushed into a bucket on Google Cloud Storage. We then push this data into BigQuery using gcloud command line. All of this being orchestrated by Wearscape, interacting with that uh, shared metadata repository, which we decided to put on SQL Server, uh, on Cloud SQL. Uh, so once the data is in BigQuery, uh, we're then able to apply our models, our transformations, again using Wearscape, and then this data is then pushed out to MicroStrategy and to the end user. Um, so I appreciate this is a very quick and rushed look at how we've began our cloud migration, but hopefully it gives you a few ideas on how we've approached this so far and some of the things we've had to consider. I will now pass you on to Sarah Bradbeer, who's going to talk a little bit about automation here at Admiral. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Bradbeer. Um, I'm a chapter lead and I've been in Admiral around four and a half years. Today I'm going to give you four examples of how we use Wayscape Red Metadata as part of our on-premise automation. Our automated processes speed up our time to deliver, improve our standards where the manual equivalents are repetitive and prone to human error, and they generally make our engineers super happy. The diagram on the right gives a high level view of the systems we use as part of our automation. Jenkins pipelines trigger PowerShell scripts that are stored in GitHub uh, that connect to our Wayscape metadata database via ODBC and push and pull data to and from Confluence and Jira via their REST API. My first example is unit testing, which encompasses th around 30 tests um, to our data and metadata, checking for common issues such as duplicate rows or adherence to naming conventions. As, um, uh, much of this, as with much of our automation, this is managed by um, Jenkins triggering PowerShell script. Um, and, but how does it know which objects to unit test? So our unit tests are associated with Jira tickets and any objects that are changed as part of a Jira gets tagged with the Jira number in Wayscape Red. Then it's super easy for a script to identify those objects in the metadata before performing the unit tests. We log our results in Jira in the comments and work log. Just so it's highly visible to everyone. The uh, screenshot on the right um, is an example of the kind of detail that goes into our work log. There's a list of objects tagged in Wayscape Red and then a list of unit test failures. So for example, there's one way that's saying the primary key is set to be nullable and an empty table. My next example relates to our data model documentation in Confluence. So I'm sure you'll agree that good documentation is super useful for our engineers um, and business users, but it takes up precious time to maintain. As a result, our documentation was inconsistent and unreliable. So we automated the bulk of this using Wayscape Red metadata. As with um, the previous example, we grab the objects tagged with a particular Jira number and then get their metadata such as descriptions and data types and how it conforms across our data model and we post that to a Confluence template. The screenshot on the right shows a typical page, and this page has been updated as a result of a change to that object. The red boxes show where there's been a change, so there's been a change to a description of a column, and a new column has been added to this object. My last example, um, no, this is my next example, not my last example, is um, around how we handle our GDPR um, obligations in the data warehouse. 
So this was previously a fully manual process where we had to check through tables looking for personal data um, to delete or mask it. Um, and it was super time consuming and prone to errors such as um, missing data or orphaning data from deleting in the wrong order. Um, and we even saw examples of previously deleted data being reintroduced from source. So we automated this by creating a reference table that contains joint conditions to objects that contain personal data. Um, and so when we get a GDPR request, we um, input the data subject key, such as policy number or court number, into an audit table. And then we trigger a, um, a, a pipeline that uh, uses the reference table to generate a load of SQL statements, identifying those records re related to the data subject. We check and execute those statements manually, um, and the pipeline can be uh, scheduled so that it can check that deleted data stays deleted. My last example um, relates to how we get into the cloud mindset by creating temporary environments. So we had a need to create some temporary uh, test and development environments so we could work in parallel without impacting other testing and development and so that we could prototype without risk, um, knowing we could just tear it down and start again if necessary. So to do this, um, we, we had some considerations since we were on premise. So we had some space issues um, and also some of the bureaucracy around creating new environments. So we decided to create some skeleton environments. Then when a temporary environment is required, Again, the pipeline's triggered and it automates the process from backing up from source databases to um, putting them into the target environment and then replacing any reference to, to the source with the target and recompiling objects. So the screenshot on the right shows a confluence page we have about our TT environments. The four boxes represent four environments three amber, meaning they're in use, and one that's green, which means it's free to use. Along with the status of the environments, we also say, uh, we also show who generated those environments and when and for what purpose. So that's the end of my bit. And next is Christian to talk about the future of our automation and how Wayscape Red is going to support our journey to the cloud. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Faber and I'm going to continue talking a bit more about the automation and what we are currently working on and how Wearscape is really helping us with our journey into the cloud. So first of all, I want to go uh, back slightly to the GDPR where Sawa was talking about how we are saving all the data currently in physicalized tables as you can see here. Unfortunately, that would mean that we would have to do this on every environment which goes a bit against our work, natural workflow where we want to deploy stuff from the environments with the help of Wearscape. So it also has essentially issues with like, will this go out of sync, human errors, people overlooking this. So our solution to this, again, with the help of Wearscape, is actually using free form metadata that we can attach to the columns as JSONs directly. So as you can see there, we can now specifically say to every column, this is PI data, this is not PI data, and this can be done now set as part of the standard development process. This means that when we go and to deploy stuff into the test environments or into the live environments, it just moves along with it, and we have only one true source of the data. This, of course, enables us as well to do a lot of automation and reporting on like, how widespread is PI data across. Now, another advantage of Wearscape is around the scheduling. What you see here is um, the scheduling time of one of our jobs, where we took the finish time minus the schedule time, not the start time, the schedule time. And you see there's quite a bit of variance. This is because our on-prem box is non-inclusive, and every now and then you get developers running very naughty queries against that that end up impacting the entire box. We, however, do have the opportunity and the possibility to add additional cores to increase essentially the performance. Of course, that costs money, so we have to be clever about it, uh, how we do this. So we can use this data to essentially derive thresholds to figure out when do we need to put more cores on and how many cores do we need to put on. We can have a script that runs regularly, checks against this data, 
and that means we end up essentially with an adaptive server boosting on-prem, thanks to the metadata. Now, I want to move on to talking about a cloud. Oh, that was two. So, obviously, moving into the cloud, there's loads of issues that you'll encounter. You, some of the classics like, oh, uh, the firewall is blocked, even though InfoSec definitely told you it has been opened. I, I won't want to talk about it. I just got to mention two things here that I've personally found quite interesting. One of them is the Google server always seeming, SQL server always seeming to default to UTC. Okay, means we have to move every all, all of our address scheduling like the Wearscape to UTC as well, because otherwise we end up in the twilight zone. We definitely don't want that, right? However, that also means then half of the year uh, our business will get the reports an hour later than they expect. So we still have to do a bit of work and discuss with Google whether it's just a, we would be able to just change uh, it to any other time. So the other thing I want to discuss is how to skill up people to the cloud. It's a big move, it's a big shift. So the first phase is where we as a department are in at the moment. We have a dedicated team that is essentially doing all the prototyping at the moment, that is establishing the connection, setting up everything, making sure it works, and translating all the templates. This is something I'll go uh, get back to in a moment. The second phase then will be using this setup and using the ability in Wearscape to essentially easily create copies to have sandboxes where we then can have, for example, automated internal certification or hackathons to give the people really some practical experience as part of the onboarding process. And then we will be able to gradually move people into the cloud based on domain work. So for us, data domains would be, for example, something that's just for travel or something that's just motor or perhaps even some internal data. So smaller data chunks where we can move then people slowly at a time into the cloud. Now I mentioned the advantages of Wearscape with our journey into the cloud. In principle, we can lift the entire data warehouse, the metadata, at least not the data, just the metadata into the cloud. Why does this work so well? Because everything is template based. So whether you create tables, whether you insert the data, whether you update data, it's all template based. So now we just have to translate those from essentially what is currently stored procedures into Python scripts and that, for example, run Terraform for the connections now. This has another huge advantage, which is what we see here is an example of the jobs uh, scheduler. It looks exactly the same. This isn't just because I was cheeky and just copied the image. It's generally that's how it's supposed to look like. Because at a high level, we want to ensure that everything looks as similar as possible. So while um, all the tables are still being loaded, this is what's saying in the process, what happens on-prem is again a stored procedure. What happens now on the cloud is going to be a Python script. But high level view it's going to look exactly the same. Building new tables, adding new metrics, this will look the same. And I think we, this will really help us with the onboarding process and the buy-in of getting everyone up to speed in the cloud. Unfortunately, this is all that I have time for. So I'll hand back to Josh for the summary. There you go. Fantastic. Great. So just to summarize, um, what do we talk about today? Um, we talked about our conform data warehouse and how it's accelerated by Wearscape and Wearscape's tools. Um, we talked about our journey to migrate this data solution to GCB and the challenges, that, the challenges that we faced along the way. And finally, the benefits of automation to leverage our data warehouse strategic solution and obviously the future of automation. Um, I really appreciate you all uh, for listening today. Um, I don't believe we have much time, but um, myself, Richard, Sarah, and Christian will be here for the next two days. If you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to speak to us after this, uh, after this is finished. But uh, thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.